The experience of love. I mean, think about it. What is it in this world that you want more than love? I don't really think anything. A lot of people tell me they want something more. They tell me they want money, or they tell me they want success, or they tell me that they want their body to be in perfect shape. But the truth of the matter is, when you really love yourself and you really love other people, you find that life is an incredible journey where things flow, and where no matter what happens, you find a way to enjoy yourself and you feel fulfilled. Now, love is one of the most difficult things in the world to describe. I mean, how do you describe it? You look it up in a dictionary and what does it say? It says things like, well, strong affection for something, an attraction or an attachment to, unselfish, loyal, and benevolent concern, to hold dear or to cherish something. Maybe it's really something we can't even describe with words. I mean, the dictionary is a good example of that. But it's something we can all feel in our hearts, and we do on a regular basis when we're feeling happy. And when it's missing, our life feels empty. So what is this thing we call love and how do we experience more of it? Well, this whole issue is about love. So I thought I'd go to some of the experts. This month's book summary, for example, is with Dr. Barbara DeAngelis. The title is How to Make Love All the Time. Kind of a provocative title and a book I think you'll really enjoy. And I went this month and interviewed Dr. Leo Biscaglia. What an incredible man. I, as you get a chance to visit on the next tape with him, I think you'll really be touched. He's often known as the love doctor, but he's a lot more than that. I wanted, though, in this issue where I was chatting with you to talk to you about what keeps us from having love. You know, Leo talks quite a bit about how we have to learn to love, that it isn't necessarily a natural thing, but how to express it and how to share it is something that we really have to facilitate within ourselves. But I thought quite a bit about why is it that so many people are surrounded by love but don't really feel it? Or why is it that people have such a mixed feeling about love? It's like a push-pull relationship for most people. Yes, they want it, but they also fear it simultaneously. I mean, think about it. People around you can totally adore you, and you can feel unadored, unloved, unappreciated. See, nothing in the outside world is ever going to make us feel loved until one day we make a decision to really love ourselves. But you and I live in a society where that's not the thing to do. In fact, think of all the connotations that go with loving yourself. Egotistical, out of control, full of oneself. And none of us want to do that. You know, that all means pain in our society. Yet at the same time, when someone reaches out and touches you, and it feels incredible inside, who's doing the feeling? Who's generating that emotion inside of you? It's still you. You're giving yourself permission at that moment to say, because this person has touched me this way, I'm going to allow myself to have these feelings, these sensations that I adore, that I cherish. And you let them happen only during that moment. But the truth is, those feelings are inside of you right now. Even if someone didn't touch you, you could have those feelings. But you've got to decide to. You've got to decide that you're worthy of it. You've got to decide that it's not only okay, but it's a necessity. That it's as important to you as food or anything else. So why don't we have love in our life? Number one, because we just don't believe we can have it. So many people have been without this feeling of love for so long, they don't even believe it's part of their life. They fall into that trap of believing the past equals the future. Instead of knowing that in every moment we can stop, we can get off our old patterns, and we can immediately change the way we think and feel about anything. And this gift called love is right now at your fingertips. It's always there. All you've got to do is focus on its being there. But you know what a lot of people do? They say, yeah, I notice there's love there, and I, I feel it, and I know it's there, but they're disassociated from it. They're afraid to have the feelings. And I can, you know, I can relate. I've had some painful experiences in my life, too. I've had situations with people I gave my heart and soul to years and years ago, and things disappeared for a variety of reasons, and I felt so hurt inside. But the truth is the pain only went away when I decided to love, even though the person wasn't there. When I loved myself. When I continue to love the person, not be attached to them, not having to have them be there in my life and still be able to love them. Love is not limited to people or things or situation or time. It's an unlimited resource. And when we deal with it like it's scarce, we get into a fear mode. We get into a frenzy. We try to possess love. We try to possess other people. And all that creates is more and more frustration and more and more fear because we know sooner or later, well, things are going to change. You know, the only thing we can all count on in our lives is that things will change. That's the one thing that's for certain in your life. So if your fear is, oh, if things change, I won't have love in my life, or if this person changes, or if they look at life differently, or if I have to move, or something else occurs, I'm going to lose love, then you're going to live in fear the rest of your life. 
You have to know inside that there's a timeless part of you, a part of you that has unlimited and eternal love, a part of you can tap into at any moment in time, and you've got to just focus on it. So what is it that keeps us from really having our love? Well, let's make a look. Let's review what I just said. One, most people don't believe they can have it because they haven't felt like they had it in the past. All that's saying is, in the past, you played a bunch of lousy records inside your head. You didn't pay attention. You didn't notice what was there, and so you're going to continue to do it. You can change it right now by decision. You can decide you deserve to have love because you're alive. If your creator thought enough of you to bring you into this world, certainly you deserve this experience of wonder and mystery and joy and fulfillment we call love. Why else do people not have love? <laughs> Simple, they're afraid. They're afraid because once they felt love and then it disappeared. What should be worse, never to feel love? Or at times to feel like you lost it simply because you were confused and thought it was coming from somewhere else. I know what it feels like and when it seems like it's gone away, when it hasn't really gone away at all. See, we don't want to make the mistake of blaming love when somebody leaves us in a relationship or when things don't work out or when we leave somebody else or we get frustrated. Love is not the problem. The problem is a values conflict or a rules conflict or a beliefs conflict between you and another person. Or as Tina Turner would say, what's love got to do with it? The answer is nothing. The relationship didn't end because of love. It ended because you didn't express more of it or you didn't feel more of it within yourself and therefore you didn't nurture yourself and the person you were in a relationship with. You can't fear love. You can't fear the thing you want most or you'll feel empty inside. You gotta go for it. You gotta have the courage to break through those barriers and say, I'm gonna love, because look at the alternative. The alternative is feeling empty and alone. And none of us want that. So you gotta have the courage to love someone else, to put yourself on the line, and you can't do that unless you have something to fall back on. And the thing you always have to fall back on is loving yourself. You know that if you express love to somebody else and they don't seem to receive it, you received it. In order to express, you gotta feel it in your gut first. You got the gift. And it's your responsibility to nurture it within yourself so you have more to give. And you know what? Out of some of the most painful experiences, people often realize what's really most important in their life. They realize that they want that love and they want to share it. Because love that's kept inside is wonderful, but it expands like crazy when we give it away. It's that only gift that you have where the more you give it, the more you receive. And if sometimes you give it out and it doesn't seem like you're getting it back, you're probably just not noticing some other source of it. You're not noticing what you're feeling inside yourself as you're expressing it. So the next time you think, I'm not going to love this person because if I do, I'll just get hurt. Think of how ridiculous that is. You're hurt right now. And the only way to get out of being hurt is go love somebody, starting with you. You know, express your feelings. It's one of the gifts you have in life. There is a challenge, of course, and that is within human beings, most of us have a much greater fear of loss than we do have a desire for gain. That is, that fear of loss keeps us from doing the very things that would give us what we want most. So why not use this principle? And the way to use it to overcome your fear of being loving and giving your all, if you find yourself in a position saying, you know, I really can't give my all because then I'm going to get hurt, then think about this. If you don't express your love, then you've already lost it. I mean, if you don't give your love, think of the alternative. You'll have none. At least now you've got a possible opportunity for feeling it if you're willing to express it to somebody else without filters. And if you don't, you'll never have it. So if you need to, use the fear of loss in an accurate way. You can only lose what you won't give when it comes to love. I remember when John Wooden, the great coach of the UCLA Bruins, was leaving UCLA and everyone gathered and there was all this pain and sorrow about him leaving and broken hearts as everyone talked about. But the truth of the matter is what people really were doing at that time is focusing on what they were losing instead of what they gained. And fortunately somebody was very smart because they created a trophy for John Wooden that inscribed upon it said the real message of love. It said simply, Coach, what we've given we will have forever. What we failed to give is lost for eternity. Make sure that you, while you're here, focus on giving your all. And the more you give, as you and I both know, the more you receive. There's another source also. There's an eternal source called your creator that you could turn to at any time. You don't have to operate out of scarcity. But you know, I think one of the biggest reasons people don't feel love is they just don't focus on it. I have to tell you, on the next tape, when you meet Leo Biscaglia, you'll be touched. 
because this man really lives what he's talking about. He absolutely radiates warmth and depth and caring. He is purely loving. And you know why? It's his whole life. 24 hours a day, this is what this guy focuses on. He has decided in his life that this is the most important thing. And every moment, no matter what he's doing, whether he's talking to somebody in a grocery line, or whether he's meeting somebody for an important meeting, he has one major goal, to express and feel more love. That's it. And you feel it because he has concentrated his power in this area. Most people don't have love because they don't put their focus on it. They put their focus on how to make money. They put their focus on how to survive. They put their focus on why they don't have love in their life. And so they learn more about why they don't have any in their life and they still don't do anything to make it better. We all get what we focus on consistently, not once in a while. You can't say, well, I worked on love last week and I didn't get any back. So, uh, hey, I'm not feeling very good about this. It's not worth the effort. Well, give me a break. How do you develop a muscle? You go out there and you stretch yourself. You put yourself on the line. And if you're really going to develop a muscle, you do things that are a little bit uncomfortable. You push beyond your comfort zone. That's the only way a muscle is going to strive and grow and expand. It responds to demand. And you've got to demand from yourself that you're going to put yourself out there and you're going to express love even when it's not easy. If you do that, you're going to get the rewards that you really want. If you don't, then all these feelings are trapped inside a small part of yourself instead of flooding your whole body and soul. So the way you become a great lover is you focus on love. You focus on how to feel and experience more of it every day. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. If every single day you're asking, how can I be more loving? How can I express more love to the people around me? How can I feel more love inside? And how can I enjoy the process? You're going to get some great answers. And those answers will provide you not only with the resources, but with the experience that you really want in your life. The problem is that most of us have never made a conscious decision to focus on and notice the love around us. We haven't. In fact, what most of us have done is we've decided it's not there, and so whatever you look for, you'll find. And if you're looking for all the ways that you're not receiving any love in your life, I can promise you, you will be fulfilled with a lack of love. If that makes any sense. See, we must control our mind. We've got to focus on how to feel love and how to express it. See, in the Bible it says, love thy neighbor as thyself. That says that you need to love yourself. And most people just are so afraid of that. And they won't focus on that. Besides, there's more important things to do. We've got to pay the bills this month. And then they wonder why they overeat or drink or smoke or need to do drugs or have to sit themselves in front of a boob tube to try and distract themselves from the fact that they don't feel the depth and quality of life that they deserve. You don't want to be caught in that trap. Fourth major reason why most people don't experience love, they got such vicious rules that it'll be impossible for them to feel love. The love's inside there, but they got this combination locked to the vault that says you got to do these 22 turns in all the right places and all the right ways, or I'm not going to let you have these feelings. You know what? You didn't set up the rules of your life. Some people's rules are ridiculous. Things like, well, if you love me, then you'll always be there for me every moment of my life. Well, listen, if somebody's there every moment of your life, you'd probably get burnt out. Would you say, get away from me? You know, we don't want somebody there all the time. You only think you want that when you don't have it. What you want is somebody you can share with. Another one I hear couples say to each other all the time and things like, well, if you really love me, then you'd understand me and I wouldn't have to say it. Well, sure, love makes you a mind reader too. Again, what has love got to do with it? See, we got these weird rules. You know, if you love me, then you're going to buy me 22 diamond rings and you're going to be here all the time. Well, I got to go out and make the money so I can buy you the diamond rings. <laughs> the reality is... We have not chosen our own rules, and a lot of them are messed up, and most of us don't even know what they are. We should all adopt a real simple rule for love. I feel loved anytime I'm being loving to myself, anything, anyone, any concept, anytime I'm feeling that love to my Creator, anytime I value life or nature or people or ideas, anytime I cherish anything, anytime I feel emotions of tenderness or gentleness or caring that's a time of love and anytime I do that I get to feel love and anytime I do that I want to express it and express it as deeply and fully as I possibly can that's where joy and fulfillment come from in life living and breathing with life where you value and appreciate all that surrounds you that's living in love and it brings up the fifth reason why most people don't have love in their life they don't notice all the little ways they could be experiencing it right now. They don't notice all the opportunities that are there. You know, part of understanding what it takes for us to really feel love is understanding a little bit about how our brain works. 
All of us judge other people by what they do. See, how do you know a stranger, you meet somebody for the first time, how do you know what they're really like? They could tell you what they're like and you take a certain amount of that in, but really don't we judge people by their actions? We don't judge so much by what people say as much as what they actually do. And you know what? You also judge yourself the same way. You might say, well, I'm a really loving person, or I really care about this person, or I really care about myself. But if you don't consciously do things that are loving for the people around you and for yourself, you're not going to really believe it deep in your heart, or at least you'll question it. See, what I really want you to leave this power talk with is one simple thought, that love is something that's available every moment of our lives, but all we have to do is choose to experience it. And the best way to know we're experiencing it is to commit an act. The act of love is the really vibrant love. It's the kind of love that we really want inside. And the only way to have it is to express it, to notice all the little opportunities to make things happen. You know, often we buy into the theory that there's only one person that we can love or only one series of people or one family or group of people rather than seeing that strangers are, are an opportunity for us to express love. In fact, strangers are a great place you can express love and not be threatened as to whether or not it's going to come back or not. If it doesn't come back, it's no big deal. I'll tell you something I started doing a few years ago that really enriched my life. You know, I used to just notice love only when I was like with Becky or with my kids or when I was doing a seminar. And I started thinking, that's so dumb. I mean, there's all these people that I could be loving around me. I don't have to get up and do a speech to change somebody. In fact, I found oftentimes I didn't have to say anything. But just with a loving look, I could change somebody's state. And it gave me such a hit when I could see it really did work. And for the last few years, I developed a great habit. You know, I used to look at people who were massively overweight, I mean obese, or somebody who, for example, had some kind of handicap. And I used to get these terrible feelings inside and feel bad for them. And now what I do is I just look at them from a distance or as I walk by and I just beam love into them. I just think about what it would be like to have this person feel totally loved and healed. Now I know that sounds airy-fairy. But you know what? Somehow in the back of my head, I believe that that makes a difference. If for nobody else, it does to me. It makes me feel that I'm connected to people and that I really do care. It's an act of love. And that simple action reminds me of the connection I have with other people. It allows me to connect with strangers and have strangers connect with me. I don't ever do any more what I used to do years ago, which is walk into a room of people and feel totally alone. I now walk in and I feel a connection with every person there before I open my mouth. And by the way, do you think that affects the way they feel about me? You bet it does. Do you think they respond differently to this stranger when he walks in and he's got this certain expression on his face that has to be coming through when I'm feeling these feelings inside? It's allowed me to go into environments with unbelievably successful and wealthy people who are all playing the quote-unquote business game of life and connect at a heart level in a matter of moments. It's made my life richer. But that's part of just noticing all the opportunities and creating experiences, creating opportunities to experience love. They're there every moment of your life. Choose them, select them, take action upon them, and you'll get back the gift that you're giving. So how can we demonstrate love for ourselves? Again, it feels so weird to do that. You have just got to flat decide that even though it feels weird and it feels new, that you're going to flat love yourself because you can't love somebody else unless you love you. So how do we let ourselves know that we really love ourselves? How do we demonstrate it by our actions, not just by saying, oh yeah, I love myself. Yeah, intellectually you may love yourself, but emotionally you've got to let yourself know you really care. Because if you don't have that deep caring, you keep trying to express it to other people, you're going to run out empty pretty soon. Because you can't give to other people what you haven't first given to yourself. You can't give what you don't have. So what are some ways you can really love yourself? Well, number one, do the things for yourself that you would do for somebody you really loved. Have that same kind of caring. Value yourself the way you would value somebody you were in love with. How can you demonstrate it, though? Well, how do you demonstrate it to somebody you love? You tell them. Maybe you need to really let yourself know you care. Have a conversation with yourself. Here's a weird thing to do. Go to a mirror, look yourself in the face, and say, I love you. Now, I know it'll probably take you like four or five days to do this. I mean, this takes some real courage. And you say, oh yeah, it sounds like a real 60s, 70s kind of thing. But I mean, seriously, you've got to let yourself know that you really do care. A second way you can do this is just to express your real feelings and not shut them down. See, part of loving yourself is letting yourself feel this experience called life. Even those things that don't feel so good, letting yourself get them out of your system is really important. 
See, if you're in a relationship with somebody and you're feeling some negative feelings, you just keep shutting them down and say, you're wrong for feeling that way. You're sure as heck not going to make them feel very loved. And you won't feel loved if you do that to yourself. Let yourself know it's okay to feel anything. You have a right to feel anything. And then choose to feel the way you want to feel. But nurture yourself that way. Another way you can do this, third way, would be physically take care of yourself. See, if you're overeating or drinking or smoking or doing anything like that, all you're really saying is you don't love yourself enough. You aren't valuing your own body and emotions enough. You're looking for love in all the wrong places, as the song says. What you got to do is go back to the source. See, discipline to me is only an expression that you care about yourself, that you love yourself. Discipline is not hard when it's come from a place of caring about yourself. Discipline is always hard when it's a must, when it's a necessity, when it's something you have to do to get a result. It's easy to do when it comes from a place of love. Everyone deserves the gift of vitality and passion, and they only come from loving yourself. Taking care of your body is an expression of that love, and it gives back rewards far beyond anything you can imagine. Take the time and give the gift. A fourth major way you can love yourself is to forgive yourself. There's so many people just stay hateful towards themselves and they wonder why they don't feel love from others. You can't feel from somebody else when you're busy or hating yourself because you made some mistake a long time ago. We all are going to screw up. We're all going to do things wrong at times. We're all going to get in a bad state and do something to embarrass ourselves. And if you live in fear of that or if you focus on all the challenges you've had in the past, you're going to live in pain and you're not going to have anything to give to anybody else, much less yourself you got to let go. Recently, I I heard a quote. I'll never forget. I don't even know where it came from. Maybe it was in my visit with Leo Bascalia. Maybe it was, I don't know. But to the best of my memory, it went something like this. A man must learn to let go as easily as he grasps. Otherwise, he'll find that his hands are full and his mind is empty. We need to remember that letting go is a gift. And if we can just let go, if we can just forgive, we can just consciously choose to say, hey, What I did there wasn't really great, but I've learned my lesson. I'm not going to do it again, and beating myself up is not either loving nor is it making it better. I've got to move on. Remember, trying to drive into your future while you're using the rearview mirror to guide you is a great way to make sure you crash. Let go. Love yourself. A fifth way to love yourself is to be optimistic. You know, optimism is a choice. You can at any moment in time expect the best or expect the worst. It's up to you. But the problem is most of us are not consciously choosing what to focus on. We're just running some old patterns. And a lot of us have patterns that make us feel lousy. Think about it. When you're optimistic, you feel happy. You feel excited. You have a sense of possibility. And in that state of mind, it's easy to love yourself and even easier to love other people. But when you're in a state of gloom and doom, when you keep focusing on the worst possible scenario and you expect it to happen... You can't feel love inside yourself. If someone else was loving you, you wouldn't even notice it. You're too caught up in your negative state. Plus, who wants to try and express love to somebody who's negative? You just feel like you'd be rejected anyway, so you probably wouldn't receive the love from others that you want so desperately. You're driving them away from you. Optimism is a gift. And by the way, being realistic does not create more love. In fact, studies have shown that people that are more realistic don't do as well as people that are optimistic. Out of our realism, we often limit what we're really capable of. See, you want to give yourself a gift? Give yourself the gift of seeing yourself bigger than you thought you were, more capable than you thought you were. The only time to be pessimistic is if your life was on the line. I might be a little pessimistic about jumping in a helicopter that's got one of its rotors broken off, but I don't want to be pessimistic about love. Hey, what if I'm being optimistic about this love relationship working out and it doesn't? What's the worst that can happen? I had the love while I was thinking about it. I'm not going to die. Be real with yourself. Give yourself the gift of optimism. Here's a sixth way that you can really love yourself and demonstrate it by your actions. Consciously, each day, catch yourself doing things right. So many of us are so quick to focus on and notice all our imperfections and we beat ourselves up about it. It's ridiculous. Catch yourself doing things right. Isn't that what you do with your children? How do you express love to them? You find all the great things they're doing and you praise them like it's going out of style. You want to see your life change? Start finding ways to praise yourself, catching yourself doing things well instead of beating yourself up when you do things wrong, and you'll find you'll want to give and be and do more in your life, and you'll feel more love. Seventh way to love yourself is to keep a journal. See, if you keep a journal each and every day and you write notes to yourself about your day and what was valuable and what you learned and what you created, you'll be nourishing your mind, your emotions, your soul, because you'll be capturing your life. And if your life's worth living, it's worth recording. 
go get yourself a hardbound journal and start keeping notes with yourself on a daily basis and you'll find that you'll have captured more of your life and that'll be giving yourself another gift. In essence, I could go on and on. What do you need to do to demonstrate you love yourself? Anything you would do for somebody you love. That's what you got to learn to do for yourself too. And you can't see it as selfish. As it said in a really good book a long time ago called The Good Book, love thy neighbor as thyself. You have the right, the privilege, and the responsibility to take care of yourself, to value yourself, to cherish yourself, to treat yourself with the same kind of caring and tenderness that you do those people you love. Because it all starts here. So everything else we're going to talk about with love needs to be filtered through this frame. This is the foundation that it all must come through. So here's your assignment for the month. First of all, I want you to commit three acts of love. Now that sounds kind of fascinating, doesn't it? But I mean, first of all, I want you to figure out something you can do to really love yourself. Something that'll be an act, a demonstration of that love you have for yourself. I don't care what it is, if it's taking time for yourself in a special way or getting a massage or taking some special singing or dancing lesson, but I want you to give yourself some unique gift. I don't care what it is. Having done this now, having demonstrated to yourself that you really do care, and now I have to tell you what I really believe in my soul, and that is loving yourself has to be there. You can't go and just love somebody else if you don't feel it within yourself. But if all you do is keep it in yourself and you don't express it, you'll never feel love at the deepest level. The ultimate levels of love, obviously, are when you get to express and share them with others. You say, well, that sounds like a contradiction. You spent this whole day telling me I should love myself. Now you're telling me the deepest love is from loving other people. Yes, I am. But I'm also telling you, if you go around loving other people and you don't love yourself, you won't feel the love that you're giving. It's got to start with you. And you have a greater capacity if you take care of yourself. But you're right. There's more love in expressing to others than you're going to get just expressing to yourself simply because when you are experiencing love and you're burning with love, it only gets more powerful when you connect with some other wood and call another human being. Now instead of just a stick on fire, we got a bonfire going. There's just no doubt about it. Expressing love to others is the richest experience in life as long as you give yourself permission to feel it for yourself too, which is really why I took the time to chat with you on this tape. I know you know this stuff. I'm asking you to live it. There's a difference. We all know what to do, but you've got to do what you know. And each one of these little sessions is designed to remind you of what really is there. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a good coach. A coach doesn't always tell you something you don't know. Sometimes they tell you things you already know, but by hearing it again, it gets you to take a look at it and really apply it. I hope you apply loving yourself on a more daily basis. I hope tomorrow morning when you wake up, you'll cherish yourself more. You'll nurture yourself. You'll care about yourself. And in doing that, I know you'll have more to give to others. But I will then want you to do what I know you want to do. With that great foundation, go out and express it for others. Everybody. But your second assignment is do it for somebody who's close to you. Find some unique way to let them know how much you care, how much you cherish them. Do it in a fun way. Do it in a creative way. Too many of us in life start thinking, well, they know I love them. Heck, you know, I tell them all the time. But sometimes we get habituated. That if somebody hears us say, I love you, I love you, I love you, so many times it doesn't really have the same meaning anymore. We've got to demonstrate our love. Remember, love is an action. So I want you to express and demonstrate your love to somebody close to you in a fun, creative, outrageous way they will not forget. I want you to create a moment for that person. See, I'll never forget the challenge I had. I have four children, and three of them came to me all at one time when I married my wife, Becky. How do you get all these kids to feel loved by me simultaneously? And especially when, you know, I'm some weird stranger. It was tough. And as I got to know them, I really started to love them as my heart and soul. And they were all my blood children as far as I was concerned. But how do you express it to them? Especially when you're living on the road and you've got this intense lifestyle. And I realized that the way to do it is I had to create moments. Moments they would not forget. See, in my lifetime, you know, I didn't have a lot of time with each of my fathers. But I can tell you, I can remember certain key moments that we shared that I hung on to and they created that feeling of love for me even when I couldn't be with them. So I thought, how can I do this with my kids? How can I get it across to them? And so I found I was in a dilemma. I mean, it was pretty tough. Three boys and a girl. My youngest son, Jarek. How did I let him know when he was four years old that he was loved and let my 20-year-old at the time let him know that he was loved? Totally different strategies, I can promise you that. With Jarek, I found that what he loved to do more than anything else was just spend time with me out in a dirty field, running around playing all these imaginary games. Well, you can imagine how excited I was about doing that. But you know what? 
I realized that's what makes him feel loved. So I decided to just get into it. That loving someone is giving to them, giving them what they want, not what you want to give. You know, I might want to do a bunch of different things for him, but what he wants to do is run around this field. So darn it, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm not just going to do it out of a sense of obligation. I'm going to do it out of a sense of passion. And so we have this blast. We go out and play these games. And, you know, I, Jarek thinks I'm a giant. So he points at this giant boulder and says, Dad, pick that up and throw it. You're a giant. And I'm over here picking this boulder up and throwing it, you know. And he's laughing and I'm laughing. And we have these great times. And, you know, I want to be able to express love to him in so many ways. When I grew up, you know, we didn't have a lot of choices economically. So when I started making money, I thought, what a great thing I can give to my kids. But at the same time, I appreciate everything I have in my life because I earned it. it creates a little bit of a dilemma. So I thought, oh, how do I do this? So what I've learned to do is have my kids earn things, but every once in a while I go crazy and surprise them. So Jerick and I, one day I said, hey, let's go to the toy store. And let's get one toy because you've been such an awesome kid. You deserve one toy. So we go to the toy store. And going to the toy store with Jerick and I is like watching the movie Big. We run her all over the place and we play with all the toys and people who recognize me from my TV show look at me like I'm crazy and I have a good time. And Jarek laughs and I'll never forget, we went around and around, checked all these toys and I said, okay, you can have any one toy in the store, it doesn't matter what it is, but just one, but any toy you want. He looked at me and said, I know what it is, Dad, and he ran off. So I waited for him and he came back with a plastic rake. <laughs> I said, that's what you wanted, if anything, in the store? Uh, he said, yeah, Dad, this is great. We'll go home. We'll break a bunch of leaves. And I thought, I thought that's why I worked so hard. So I wouldn't have to rake leaves anymore. But that's what he wanted to do. I was so disappointed. I had several toys that I'd hoped he'd pick out. The bottom line is we went back and we raked for a couple hours. But you know what? That's really what he wanted. He loved it. And I loved it too. And we laughed and we giggled. And we told stories. And you know what? I gave to him what he wanted, not what I wanted. And he gave me what I wanted. Because I felt this incredible connection and bond. I can promise you, I will never forget the days of raking with Jarek. And I don't think he will either. We've all had moments in our life that really touched us. If we want to experience more love, we don't even have to go create new moments. We can just remember some of the old ones. And that's going to be your third assignment. Your third assignment is, I want you to remember some of the most loving moments of your life. Go back and touch them again. Remember them. See them in your mind, step into the picture and live the memory and give yourself some of that juice and remember that it's right there inside of you and it's available at any time. Most of us fail to realize that our life comes down to memory management. That if you manage your memories, you got more joy in there than you ever dreamed of. And if you don't manage your memories, you'll come up with all the garbage that will make you feel like your life is not worthwhile. I'll never forget, for example, the first time I saw Les Miserables where the main character, Jean Valjean, was such a good human being, such a deep spiritual human being, and such a giver, and feeling this incredible connection and love for this man. In this play, there's so many sources that tap into the fabric of our spirit through love. I'll never forget that time in Denver, the day after I met Becky, and I was surrounded by people in a seminar, and I saw her approaching, and I wasn't gonna get a chance to talk to her, and she ran up and handed me a quick little note I couldn't wait for people to leave so I could read it. And on the note it said, I want more. Can you get free? <laughs> what a great set of feelings. I'll never forget the day that Jarek was born. I held him for the first time and he looked up into my eyes. Or the first time my daughter Jolie looked me in the eyes with tears in hers and said to me, how come God was so good to me to give me you as a dad? Moments. The first time I got to fly with my son Tyler when he first got his helicopter license. He was able to solo and seeing the excitement and the passion and the pride in his eyes and knowing that somehow I'd helped to contribute to that and feeling the bond with him. Seeing my son Joshua going out there to hit a baseball, coming in and giving him a big hug afterwards and feeling the connection and excitement that comes from growing and expanding together. Life is rich. Make sure along the way you don't miss the moments or life will pass you by. So I've given you a lot in here. I get carried away. I just want to get through to you that this is the most important experience in life. And I know you know that, but I'm here to remind you. That's what I'm here for, to tease you, harass you, cajole you, and get you to love yourself. You do that, you'll want to love every person you meet, strangers, weird people, nice people, in-between people. Listen, I've worked with people from every walk of life, every kind of personality, people with 49 personalities and people who think they have no personality. We all love to be loved. We all need to express it to ourselves and to others. So you have four assignments this month, so I'll make sure they're clear.
go commit a bunch of love acts. One, commit one for yourself. Go love yourself in some unique way. Do something outrageous, fun, or nice for yourself. Two, do something special for somebody nearby, somebody you have an ongoing relationship with. Three, go do something loving to a weird stranger you don't even know. You can do it on an elevator. You can do it when you're walking down the street. Just be totally loving in a unique way to somebody you don't know and notice the joy that it'll give you knowing that's the kind of person you really are and that you're connected to every person that you meet. And lastly, four, write yourself a love letter. It's part of the book summary this month with Barbara DeAngelis. Go out and, by the way, get her book and read it. Listen to the interview with Leah Buscalia this month and then write yourself a love note. Write a note to yourself about how much you love yourself and care about yourself and who you really are and what you really stand for as a person and how proud you are that you've made it through the tough times. And that, yeah, you're not perfect, but you are great inside. Give yourself the gift of love. You deserve it because you're alive. And decide to spend the next month focusing on experiencing more love instead of how you're going to go get it. If you give it to yourself and others, you'll have more than you could ever imagine. Thanks for listening. And until I visit with you again, remember to live with passion. Well, I'm very excited today to be with you. And uh, I got up early this morning, about 5 a.m., to come visit with a very special man and have the privilege of sharing his presence with you as well. I got to drive over the mountains here in Nevada and uh, made it here to the south shore of Lake Tahoe. And the person I'm with is a gentleman who for almost two decades now has been a light for millions of people, a person who's really touched people and gotten them to remember who they really are and what's most important in life. And the man I'm speaking of is Dr. Leo Biscaglia. I am incredibly privileged to be with you, Leo. I'm really excited about being on a chance to chat with you today. Well, I'm very excited too, Tony. We've been anticipating this for weeks now. It's like you, we brought the snow for you and, <laughs> and your Santa Claus. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, meeting you for the first time, having read your books and, and heard so many wonderful and incredible things about you, all I can say is to the people that have a relationship with me, um, they're all understated, not overstated, about what an incredibly loving presence and man you are. And uh, just in the few minutes we've visited, I've really been touched by you. And uh, I'm sure our listeners will be as you've continued it for so long. You started out, um, I know years and years ago, but I think maybe the first major national exposure was when your first book came out, Love, back in 1972. And you've done now almost a dozen books and about the same number of PBS specials. Uh, I know at USC, uh, people said that, uh, I often heard it quoted, that you are a person that brought honor to the profession of teaching. And uh, I think that's true from what I've seen and what I've heard. I'd be curious to start out by just having people get an idea of um, what's brought you to this place in your life where you're so in touch with what's most important, with love and with people and with relationship. What's the genesis of that focus? And that uh, you know, Tony, I don't think I could come into focus with that. I think it's been always my eagerness to live life fully and to recognize that uh, around every corner there was excitement and wonder and mystery and an insatiable desire to understand all of those things and to experience them you know uh, my father used to say all the time he was a very wise Italian immigrant had a fifth grade education which shows you that uh, wisdom has nothing to do with the years of education yes. one has but anyway he was he used to say that the worst sin in the world was going to bed at night as stupid as you had awakened in the morning. And that's been kind of a, a way of life for me. Even as a child, I recognize the wisdom of that. So uh, I, I guess I, I spent my life in discovery. I wanted to know everything. I wanted to experience everything. I wanted to know everyone. And I was never satisfied with just being placated by knowing the person next door, or reading one book. I wanted to read hundreds of books. In fact, well, one of the early experiences of my life uh, was that I went into our public library and I decided on the spot I was going to read every book in that library. So without saying anything to anyone, I got my little library card and I checked out six books which you were limited to. And then I'd go home and read and plow through those six books. And finally, my child's librarian in there recognized what I was doing. And so she took me aside, and I'll never forget this. And then there's a wonderful story that follows it. But she took me onto the garden behind Malabar Street Branch Library, and she told me about good taste. 
And she said, you know, just because a book is in the library doesn't mean it's worth reading. She said there are some great books there and there are some awful books. And if you start with A and read through to Z, you're going to spend all of your life in A and B because I keep putting new books under A and B. Wow. So let me show you some of the great books. And she gave me six books that I went home and was just enchanted over. What were they? And, uh, oh, ask? my goodness. I, I remember... Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, some of them were, were the usual stuff, like uh, you know uh, Robert Louis Stevenson right. and and uh, the the Pathfinder and the Last of the Mohicans and and, uh, and Melville, you know, and all those wonderful things, which I realized were just stupendous. But she sort of changed my life, and she was also the one responsible for giving me my first book because she realized that to me there was such a reverence for wanting to know and to experience. And just recently, USC had an evening honoring me for my achievements in the last 20 or so years as a professor there. And they invited all kinds of wonderful people. And interestingly enough, they invited my librarian. Oh, wow, and, uh, how She is great. now in her 80s. Oh, my gosh. She is as young and youthful and beautiful as she always oh, was. That is fantastic. And talk about breaking my heart when I saw her and all these memories catapulted well, yeah. around me, you know, that were so wonderful. But, you know, to, to say that I have had a, a goal, a specific goal, would be inaccurate. But to say that I embrace, I open my arms to everything, yes. to all experiences, to all people. And uh, to do that, you must be very vulnerable. And some people see this as foolishness. I see it as the most essential trait. Yeah. for changing and for growing and for becoming. What's given you the courage to be vulnerable? Um, maybe a lot of scars. Hmm. Uh, you know, I, I always... From not say, being vulnerable? I or? always say from... No, from being vulnerable. Uh, I always say that, that uh, every lover worth the name is covered with star, with I would say stars. Isn't that marvelous? I was going to say a great photo. Uh, that is beautiful. That. That's your yes. real belief. I, that's There's your every, unconscious every belief. Every lover is covered with stars. <laughs> oh, Leo, you're There's so the poetic truth. today. There's the truth. That's the real truth. That's the but, truth. But, uh, and, but they're disguised as scars. They're, but they're, yeah, <laughs> they take the place of. But anyway, uh, we, uh, when we try to be lovers, uh, and we are vulnerable because a, a lover must be vulnerable, you're bound to encounter people that don't see what you're doing as being loving right. and so they strike out or you're rejected um, but isn't that usually out of their own fear what, what, what do you it, see it, the source of that it, you know it doesn't matter what their source is yeah. really they do it because that's what they believe right. which is valid for them at the moment but I must think about what I do with it then when it's done with me so when I reach out to someone and they smack my hand uh, I remove it because I'm human being and I it hurts but I say to myself uh, they're doing it because they need to do it. I need to do what I need to do. So when I see them again, I'm going to put my hand out again. And I find that by doing this and making myself vulnerable, after a while, uh, they either begin to see me as very naive and therefore they don't want to hurt me. Uh, like or a little they, puppy dog. Or very, yes, or very childlike. <laughs> right. And they say, oh, well, you know, that's just Leo. And, and why should we hit him when he reaches out for us? And so they're rather nice to me. And as a result... It changes their behavior, yes. too. I mean, uh, I'm not here to tell you how to live. The only one I can tell anything about living to is myself. And I know what makes, what brings me joy, what makes me happy. And I have to be willing to accept that other people have different ideas. So what does make you most happy? Well, I think, uh, first of all, people. Yes. Uh, I, I think People are the most extraordinary things. You know, I've made my life one of trying to understand behavior. And the fact that here I am, you know, in my mid-60s, and I still don't understand anything more than I did before. <laughs> and you're I, smart I'm, enough to know that. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed that every time I miss some, I, or I meet somebody, there's something totally unique. And the minute I think that I've arrived at a universal truism, I find the exception to the rule in yes. some human being I meet. And you know, at first that was very disconcerting and very disappointing. Yes. But now I find that the greatest challenge in the world because it says something about what I've been preaching for years and that everybody 
is unique. Yes. And everybody has a, a, a level of wonder and magic and spirituality that is uniquely theirs. And it doesn't matter how important they are or how successful they are or how powerful they are. They all have it. And uh, when you gain that kind of respect for the dignity of all person kind, you free them and you free yourself. It's a wonderful space to find yourself in. That's fantastic. I'm sitting here trying to remain quiet because I've got goosebumps here. I love your passion and your intensity. My gosh, I feel like I found a kindred soul here. What, um, why did you start the love class uh, at USC years ago? What was that? that? Was that in 69, 70? Yes, it was about 69. That was really a very tragic thing for me. I mean, here I was someone who all of my life had been taught to celebrate life and to revere it. To me, it's the greatest gift that we're given. And, you know, people don't treasure it. They misuse it and mistreat it. But anyway, I've always loved life. And I gained that from my mother, who was wacky, completely wacky, and my father, who was wacky in another way, and all my wacky brothers and sisters. And But anyway, I, I was teaching at SC, and it was my first year. I, I had been teaching elementary school, junior high and high school. And then uh, I went around the world for three years. And when I came back, I looked, uh, I had received my doctorate and I was ready to go into another phase and so I got a job at USC and I was teaching this class and it was one of those you know 1A classes that everybody has to take it was mandated so everybody was sitting there with this expression and I'm sure you've seen it try to try just try and teach me something you know and uh, and I just took this as a big challenge I'd worked with kids all my life and I realized that you grow older but you're still a kid yeah so what worked with the others would work with these and so I just knocked myself out and there was a beautiful beautiful young lady in that class I I really can conjure her up as vividly as if I were just looking at her now and uh she had everything, it seemed to me. She was beautiful, she was intelligent. We had taught her all the things that we define as being an educated person or a happy person, and that is to read, to write, to spell, to do arithmetic, to paragraph, <laughs> all of those things. And she had an additional streak of creativity where she used to see things in a very unique way from everyone else in the classroom. So when I read her papers, they always took what was essential to know and transposed it into something that was outstanding to communicate. So I used to love reading. Reading her work was just stunning. I, I, you're not supposed to have favorites either as parents or as, uh, or as teachers, but she was really a favorite. And uh, she encouraged me by her enthusiasm in class and so on. And then one day she was absent and she remained absent for Monday, Wednesday, Friday for about three weeks. Finally, I went to the section in the classroom where she sat. It was a big classroom. 101 classes and 1A classes are always 100, 200. Right. And I went there and asked the students around her uh, if they knew where she was. And they didn't. They didn't know what had happened to her. And none of them were particularly concerned, which was shocking to me. Was but she a loner by herself? Or? Uh, well, I see, I didn't know that much about her. Right. I, I had, I always but you had made, a great appreciation for I, her. I always like. made it uh, mandated that everyone in my class come to see me. And that uh, we'd sit down in the office or we'd go for a walk at University Park or we'd go to the Rose Garden. But I wanted to know you as a human being. It wasn't enough that you were a warm body in the class. And people came, but I was always waiting for the day when she would come and make an appointment, but she didn't. And uh, finally, I went to the Dean of Women and she was sort of shocked by my asking. She said, I thought I told you, Leo, but this young girl went to uh, Pacific Palisades, which many people know in Southern California is a place where there are sheer cliffs falling to the sea. And there were people there having a picnic and they saw her leave her car with the ignition running, but they didn't pay any attention, which is so like us and she just walked across the grass and threw herself off on the rocks below. She was 22 years young. And um, even though I, I'd always cared with a passion about life and about people, it had never been smashed at me in such a violent way. And uh, I realized suddenly that what did it matter that we had taught this girl to read and to write and to spell and to do arithmetic and to paragraph if no one had ever really bothered to know who she was and what her real needs were and tried to fulfill them. And uh, so I thought, 
as far as I'm concerned, I can't change attitudes of everyone, but I could maybe set up something that would help. So I started a class that I call Love 1A, for want of a better <laughs> title, and I said I was not going to teach it, I was going to facilitate it, but we were going to come together as a group, the students, their parents, if they wanted to bring them, their wives, their husbands, their teenagers, and we were just going to talk about love, because all at once it occurred to me that we take love so for granted everybody assumes that he or she is a lover and that all we need to do is be born into the world and grow up heaven forbid in some of the environments we have to grow up with wherein we never come in contact with genuine love and yet as adults we're expected to be lovers no wonder there are so many divorces and so many suicides and because our greatest and our greatest release is loneliness Yes. It's because nobody ever realizes that love is a learned phenomenon and that if you want to learn it, like everything learned, you have to put in the effort to do so. And people laugh, you know, when you say, uh, you've got to learn to love. And they say, well, you know, there are no classes in love. And it was true because my love class was the first in the nation. In fact, so outrageous did people think it was that the National Enquirer came to USC. <laughs> and you know, USC is one of the most conservative schools in the country and the, the president almost died when he heard that National Enquirer was going to cover one of its professors. <laughs> but you know, they came and they sat down in the class and I refused to have them identify themselves. I said, that we're not doing anything here we're ashamed of. And the reporter that covered it for the National Enquirer did one of the best jobs of anybody that covered the love class wow. and finally joined the class. Wow. And, uh, but the point was that, that uh, it, this kind of brought me to the realization that most of us wander through life not only not knowing what love is, but pretending to be lovers with a little bit of knowledge that we have and unwilling really to do anything about becoming a greater lover. I mean, if you want to be a great speaker, you learn the techniques of a great speaker and you become a great speaker. If you want to become a great chef, you don't just walk in the kitchen and throw things together. You study about how to put things together so that it comes out with gourmet quality. And so it is And you with practice love. every day. And you practice passion. every day yeah. with a passion. Yeah. You make mistakes, yes. you get burned, yeah. your, your souffle falls. Yes. I mean, all these things go on, so you're not expected ever to be perfect, but you are expected to have the, the need and the desire to learn to love before the day of your death. Uh, oftentimes people wait until then to, to say, you know, I miss love. And I think when you've missed love, you've missed the essence of life. Yes. And if people don't consciously learn to love and make that a focus and a value and they take it for granted, they tend to learn to hate or they learn to survive. Something or, has what, to what fill lessons? that. Yeah, I was yes. going to say, doesn't something have to fill that yes, void? Yes, it does. And oftentimes people that don't do that either fall into loneliness and retreat or they become very aggressive and they become very, become very bitter and very angry and begin to hurt others, especially seeking out lovers to hurt. Yes. It seems to be a, you know, a passion of, of non-lovers to do so. And uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a frightening dynamic, but it's true. And I think every, every book, every word I've ever said, every book I've ever written has been focused on don't miss love. Don't uh, miss life. And don't miss life, which yeah. is one and, and the one same, the same thing. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, you and I talked earlier before we were on tape about the power of words and mm -hmm. the views that we share about that. And, you say you're suspicious of words, and yes, I hear you, I, I hear you I, use words like frightened, and uh, we had a good conversation about that also, and yet I also hear you using words like marvelous, stupendous, yes, as you just said, I, outrageous. I, that's why you should distrust words, is because there are idiots like myself who say marvelous, fantastic, unbelievable, uh, stimulating, wondrous, But magical. look at the passion you have by uh, using those words. Nevertheless. <laughs> Uh, they are very, very non-scientific. This is true. And, and they are very, very personal. And the passion that I feel for things is a very unique kind of passion, which a lot of people 
cannot understand or relate to they yeah. enjoy yes uh, we all enjoy passionate people yes. it seems to me like we go to italy and the italians oh everything's a passion you know <laughs> life's a passion death's a passion tears are passion. they cry over everything i have an aunt who is the greatest actress when she is discovered you know that she will she will win every academy award but but uh <laughs> right now she performs for the family though <laughs> oh, only and for the neighborhood everybody knows but, but nevertheless, I've always been suspicious of words. And I think that what, what I base my scientific awareness on is action. Yes. And the trouble is, though, Tony, you see, we're stuck with words. Uh, words are the vehicle we use to convey not only ourselves, but to convey our lives and our meanings. Yes. And so uh, we use the words that we have facility with, and the ones we don't have facility with makes us less than poets. Uh, so um, uh, I am suspicious of words, though I enjoy them. I love to see them bounced around magically by great orators. But then the thing that gets me to judge whether these words have true meaning is to watch what the person does. So the final result. It's the action. Yeah. It's what, what comes out of the words. But words are great fun. The big thing is to control them. Instead of letting them control to, you. Yes, yes. exactly. Yes. Because they have a tendency to do that. You know, uh, the linguist says that we are our words. And, uh, you know, the words that we have and the limitation of our words are what we have to think with. We think with language. And if we have a limited language, we have a limited thought process. Right. And uh, those people who have facility with language can expand their worlds, and that's why we should never stop reading and talking and listening and learning, because uh, the brain has no limitation. We are the ones who set the limitation, so that we mustn't accuse others. It's, it's, we must see ourselves as the culprit. Yes. I remember reading in your, uh, one of your books about a study that was done at an Eastern University about the word communism, and they went around asking people, oh, yes. what is communism? And they couldn't tell them, but they knew they didn't want any that's of it. That's right, and that they, we, they should be killed. Yes, they that's should even, be killed. That's even more frightening, <laughs> you know. I remember one woman in that study said, I don't know what it is, but we should really destroy them because they're a danger to the world. <laughs> Well, I mean, first of all, I think that it, I, maybe she's right, I don't know, but first of all, she should at least find out what she's destroying yes. before she should ask that we go and destroy them. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a terrifying thing. Uh, words can either create or they can destroy. They can enhance, you know, they can enrich, uh, or they can deplenish, they can take away. And so we have to be very, very careful with words. And even the common ordinary words, a word that frightens me tremendously and I think limits 90% of our population is no. Yes. No, no yes, sense I... chills up my spine when I hear somebody say no, you know, and they say no to life and no to love and no to beauty and no to art and no to nature and no to God. And they just no, no, no their way through life. And it's terrifying because, uh, you know, life is yes. And love is yes, and beauty is yes, and joy is yes, and even pain is yes, not no to pain. Uh, the greatest lessons I've ever learned in my life, I've learned through pain. Now, I would yeah. prefer learning through joy. Yeah, that would be the best say. way. But sometimes life is not like that. Yes. And someone you love will die or go away or, or uh, something will happen in your life or you're going to have to uh, weep. And there's nothing wrong with tears. I always say they sort of clarify the eyes and help us to see better as long as we learn. There are no bad experiences. The only bad experience is the one we don't learn from. Hmm. I couldn't agree with you more about that. You and I spoke earlier also about, I think, something else we share in common that I have a great deal of concern with some of the people who have bought into the theory of life that says 
uh, it's things are preordained either because of your family or your parents you need to go back and heal the child within you which I think is very valuable but when that becomes the source of who we are we lose the ability to shape and make decisions shape our own destiny so maybe you could talk a little bit about um, what do you think really does shape destiny and certainly our child plays a major role well you know that's that's a very profound question and I'm a very ignorant man when it comes to profound questions I, I really don't have an answer to what it is I can only tell you how I have tackled yes. this which is makes it valid for me but maybe not for somebody else I find that there are no real answers Tony to all the major questions um, we can we can have conjectures on you know why death uh, why not eternal life why not why suffering uh, why must children be abused why do some people get all the intelligence and some people are born mentally retarded how should I know? I, you know, I don't really know all of those answers. I only know that if I want to live a good life, there are certain ways in which I can proceed to live a good life. Yes. And, uh, and as long as I follow those things and I'm true to myself, uh, then I can find joy in life. But what are some but of your answers, answers to some of those questions for you? Well, uh, first of all, I think that, that uh, life is good. Yes. And people are good. And I think that we uh, sometimes get off the track because we are human and we're not gods. And I think the, some of the big problems arise when we begin to believe that we are perfect, or when we begin to believe that the world should be perfect, or when we begin to behave as if we were gods. I don't want to have power or control over anyone. My whole thesis is because I know how important it is to me is to free you to be what you are to find your own answers and then to share them with me because in this way I become enriched but uh, words like tolerance I think are beautiful words words like compromise are beautiful words and some people abhor the concept of compromise uh, I think it's if you're going to love you're going to have to learn how to compromise you're going to have to give up a little bit of you. And I think it was funny in the 60s where people would rather die, they'd say, than give up myself, you know. <laughs> and even that... Because if yourself was that limited as to that right. concept and, in the first and, place. And right? giving and, give, and also spending your life seeking for yourself. Uh, so, so many people are, are so bent on finding themselves, you know, that they lose themselves. They don't even know who they are. And even if they encountered themselves, they wouldn't recognize themselves. I love the story of the man who was out seeking uh, the, the, the meaning of life. What is life? You know, that's something uh, we also get off on. What is life? Oh, what is the meaning of life? Why am I here? Why not just live? Uh, yeah, well, live, it. live into the <laughs> and answers. And you'll find out. <laughs> live into the answers. But he goes to this guru on this mountaintop who's been up there for 25 years contemplating what is life. And everyone's sure he has the answer. And he says, what is life? And the guru says, life is a bowl of cherries. And this seeker says, it is? <laughs> and the guru says, you mean it isn't? <laughs> I love that because, you know, I, really, I, 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 when you're involved in, a, in writing books about love, about living, about learning, everyone expects that you have the answers. Yes. And so I get these letters that say, this is happening to me and this is happening to me and what shall I do? And, you know, I write back and I say, the answer for you is in you, not in me. Yes. How should I know what you should do? I don't even know who you are. <laughs> and you're asking me to solve your life's problems? I mean, you know... And hopefully that's a wake-up call from you. Well, you know, it's, it's what it is. I, and what I say to them is I have great respect for you. Because uh, if, if anything I have that has made it possible for me to survive almost anything and everything. It's a tremendous respect for the dignity of every human person. To me, I think the key word is dignity. And I think that so many times uh, we set out to destroy other people because we have no concept of their value and their worth. Or we lay upon them our concepts and our preconceptions of their value and their worth. And that's a major tragedy. I'm not here to judge you. 
Uh, and if I have a purpose for being, and I'm really not sure yet what that is, uh, it would be to enhance you. And, and for me, a glorious day or a wonderful experience is because I have encountered something or someone that I have left a little bit richer. What I hear you say, I hear kind of a little bit of a double message, and I'm sure I'm misinterpreting it, but while you don't have the answers for other people, you certainly want to share what you've learned and let them take from that what's valuable, don't that's, you? That's, that's absolutely essential. Okay. Yeah, because to have things to be for able myself, to learn from, yeah. I'd go up on a mountaintop like that silly sure. guru <laughs> and, and, and contemplate as if the world is a bowl of cherries. So when I have any kind of knowledge, yes. as far as I'm concerned, the only purpose of having knowledge is to share it. Yes. Uh, and, and if it's worked, for you, you hand it out there, but you don't say, this is it, this is the answer. Right. You say, uh, here are a lot of answers. Right. There are many alternatives. So you're willing so to share one. that with intensity, that's what you've done for years. Well, I, yes, it, it's yes. what I do and it's what I intend to do. Yes, but you just don't want people to be dependent upon you, you've made that clear. Or to, or to or assume that else. what I say is the gospel is or the right the answer gospel. for them. Right. That's right, right, because it isn't. Right. Or something that is fantastic for me. Uh, look at, you know, for years people have been trying to define what is beauty. And, you know, we've got volumes, but nobody agrees. Your beautiful might be my ugly or my unbelievably uh, repulsive, you know. So somebody walks through a museum and they look at something and say, that's gorgeous. And you think that's ridiculous. And you walk into another room and you say, that's gorgeous. And they say, that's hogwash. Right. You know, and that's wonderful, isn't it? Because art grows out of that. You see, the whole purpose of art is to educate. Interesting. What do you mean by that? Well, the artist, the, the creative person, sees things we are not able to see. Now, we are able to see. All of us could be creative and would be creative if we believed that we could be. Uh, but somebody has defined for us in the second grade that we were not artists, right. or we were not dancers, or we were not great baseball players. <laughs> and we believed them, and therefore right. we didn't become great dancers and great artists. Uh, so the, the, the point is that an artist sees in a way that is totally unique and helps us to see in a unique way, which refreshes us. So that we, you know, sometimes it's, it's that kind of aha thing that you get when you walk in front of a Van Gogh painting and you see these, these sunflowers. And you know, you've seen sunflowers before, but you've never seen them come alive. The vibrancy of the paints and what he, what he saw were so uniquely his. Now I will never see a sunflower in the same way again. Uh, so the artist points out this has always been there, but you have not seen it yet. Let me help you to see it. And then in the hopes, the real artist is like a good teacher, in the hope that then you will do something equally great or greater yes. as a result of having now awakened to what there is. Is that what you do? Is part of what you do by living your life uh, true to yourself? Is and doing it on such a massive scale and a public scale, does it awaken people? Hopefully. Well, you know, I think it's it's hard for people to know uh, me outside of what they see on a television screen or in a book. But I have to be true to myself, and then I won't deceive them. Yes. I don't think anybody will ever find that I have either done something that's that I've written about that has been untrue or told a story as an illustration or used a metaphor that wasn't an honest one to the best of my knowledge I'm true to myself and therefore everything that I give is true to the best of my knowledge and I think uh, in this way they need never be disappointed I you know one of the things that shatters me and and I've experienced it oftentimes is to have heroes all of us like heroes, they're models. And then to meet this hero or heroine and to find out that they're dishonest and that they're phony yeah. and that they're in whatever business they're in for their own good and for, their, for the money that they can make or the notoriety that they can achieve. And then that really hurts because you think about all the people that look at them and emulate them yeah. and see them as something special. 
that's the reason so many people are disillusioned and think that so many people are phonies. You know, there are a lot of people that go through their entire life never trusting anyone, and that's because they've been hurt by some figure. Uh, may I give you an illustration? Sure. I was a, a couple of years ago in Boston. I was doing a, a talk, sharing with some nurses, and we were staying at a big hotel, which is where the conference was being held. And we had heard that in that hotel were six or seven of the top-notch baseball players of a certain team that I will not mention because that really had it's neither here nor there. And the little kids in the neighborhood had also gotten onto that. And here were their heroes, these baseball players. And so they had all come there with their autograph books. And, uh, and I came down in the morning on an elevator with about five of them. And one of them was a very, very famous man in baseball profession. And when the doors opened, these little kids saw this man. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. one of them, with his eyes as big as saucers, walked up and said, Blah, blah, may I have your autograph? And he said, Shut off, kid. Oh. And I stopped in my place and saw the face on that kid. And I will never forget it. It's indelible. If we're going to assume the responsibility of being someone and especially when we realize that we are human and other people are too it gives us a responsibility to behave in the most magnificent fashion of which we are capable and never in a million years do you say to someone that comes to you shove off buster <laughs> no kidding and um. I, I think about that kid and i think about the disillusionment and i think about his never being able to look at this model again with the the love that he had when he had this dream of who this person was. Well, the more scary thing is he doesn't want to dream again because he was hurt so bad. It, it might even happen that yeah. that's true. Yeah. And uh, I remember that I, I had a great admiration for Ethel Merman. And uh, I feel sorry for a generation uh, who will not be acquainted with her verve for life and her joy in her voice. <laughs> and she never had a voice, a real voice. She had a loud voice and an honest voice. And when she was on the stage, she just shook the rafters. And she used to say it <laughs> didn't matter to her whether she was sick, whether she was miserable, and her life was often so. When she got out there, she owed her audience a performance, and she gave it. And I used to use that for years and years and years as a model. And I remember I was writing a, a syndicated article for the New York Times Syndicate for about four years, and when she died, I had the privilege of writing an obituary uh, mm -hmm. in which I stressed this, that if she had anything to teach us, it was that responsibility that we have uh, once we have an image to maintain it to strengthen it to give it away that's the only reason to have anything and yeah, to walk the talk that's right yeah. and everything that you talk about in order to live life the way you do it seems the common theme you have to have is just a tremendous amount of faith in people and life and that things happen for a reason is that true and how do you look at life and how yes, does your I, faith I, play a role I, I like I like the word hope that's kind of an open-ended, and it isn't as frightening to some people as the word faith. Because they tie some religious context. I think so. Faith is a beautiful, beautiful word, but uh, hope is something, even it seems to me, beyond faith. Hope says that there are no impossibilities. Uh, anything you can dream, you can realize. Uh, anything that, uh, that you set out to do, you can do. Hope is essential for love, and hope is essential for life. And uh, I, I think there's a difference between the kind of hope where you go with expectations, because then you're very likely to be disappointed. But uh, hope that it will happen, and if it doesn't, having the strength to understand that this wasn't the time. Not that it can't be done. Right only that this wasn't the time and you may not have been the person. But hope is, is such an open concept to hope for things, not to expect them, but to hope for them hmm. or people. What would you say um, 
it's the source. I know there isn't any one, but I'm trying to get back to it because having done some reading about you, I know, for example, your father used to ask you every night a yes. very important question. And I know that that certainly was a stimulant to some of this desire and passion for learning, at least maybe the initial trigger. What, what were some of the sources? I know your mother was an opera singer. What were some of the sources in your past that maybe uh, have influenced uh, some of the direction of your life and how you think today, some of those core beliefs? You know, uh, Tony, I, I think the most remarkable thing is that I have never met anybody in my life and gotten beyond the superficial level, which I try to do very quickly, usually with a big hug. Yes. That breaks down the barrier immediately. That I haven't found something wondrous to take away from having had that experience. Now, naturally, with the people with whom you spend the most time, i.e. my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters, my dear friends, um, you learn a great deal from all of those things. But I think there is, you know, there is no one that I've ever met if I, I, again, if I got below that superficial veneer, that didn't have something rich and wonderful to give me. So Same. every time I'm with somebody, I think, I'm going to carry away something from this situation, regardless of who they are, that I would never have had unless I had encountered them. And don't you see, that's why really I gave up everything. I sold my life insurance and my house and my car, and I went for three years around the world to find yes. out who were these other people you know and and then when we were in a war in Vietnam I understood because I was in Vietnam and I had learned to love the Vietnamese and and I, now that we're involved with all this business with the Middle East I understand a little bit about the Middle East because I was there I experienced it and and it, there's great value in in just opening yourself up to other people and to other cultures and to new ideas, because you will then emerge richer. Not as you pointed out earlier, not to keep it and store it up, but to use it to help others to gain insights. Yes. So uh, there were a great many people. Uh, my mother, my father, uh, especially my younger sister, because we were very very poor and everything had to go to the house, everything that everyone made. My elder sister had to quit school early in order to help support the family. We were a big family. And, uh, but my younger sister used to always find the means, even though she made a meager salary at the time, it was, she always found the means of giving me a dime to go to the movies. Or if she knew that I wanted a book, she'd, I'd find it under my pillow. Things like that that I never forget. Yes. And, and these people, an English teacher who once sat me outside of a bungalow in high school and said, did you know that you have a very lovely writing style that's very simple and conversational and easy to understand and you could use this as a resource? I had never known that. I mean, no one had ever told me that I, I could write a, a sentence that someone could understand. It made a difference. Um, somebody who said to me, you have to go on to school. You know, my mother had very humble dreams for her family, but practical dreams. She wanted me to be a barber. <laughs> she said, she said... I get my hair cut by you. Yeah, so she <laughs> said, there on a regular she basis. said, everybody <laughs> has hair and hair keeps growing and you'll never be hungry. <laughs> and you can have your own business and so on and so forth. Well, I couldn't convince her. I it was not right for me to be a barber I had to do other things but it took time but it, she came around to it but you know all these people have influenced my life and even I, I, I meet people every day I, I, I met well, I was once uh, speaking in in Florida and uh, a man came up to me afterward and said you have given me over the years so much I want to give you something he said may I take you to the Everglades because wow. my I have a great passion for this area and I could have said, oh no, I'm much too busy, I have to leave tomorrow. But I realized that this was a very sincere and great opportunity for me. So I canceled my airfare, or my air ticket, and I went with him for two days in the Everglades. And it's one of those experiences I know I'll never forget. Wow. Just recently, now that I've moved up here, if you want to go really enjoy God's magnificence up here, you have to take up a winter sport. Yes. Because otherwise you'd be doing nothing but sitting in front of your fireplace. <laughs> so here at my age, I've gone out and I'm learning to cross-country ski. Oh, wow. And by doing this, 
And by having people who have the patience to take me out and to help me to laugh at my clumsiness, I'm discovering what it's like to be in a primeval forest. I'm <laughs> discovering what it's like to see a full moon on the snow. I'm discovering what it's like to know what it really means to be quiet. So, uh, you know, it's just as if there's a lifetime of learning still ahead of me. And, That's clear, uh, and it's happening in every moment. And every you. second of my life, and it's, and it's not only true for me. You know, one of the things, Tony, that I know you stress, but must never, you must never cease stressing, is that all these wonders are not just available to a fortunate few. Yeah. They're available to everybody. And, and, and the more that they can latch on to that and recognize that, you know, it's, it, I can't have these things unless I do them. If you want love, you don't sit in your living room and wait for love. <laughs> love doesn't come to people who wait. It's an active thing. It's a verb. You have to go out and find it. Uh, if you want excitement in your life, you've got to make it. If you want beauty in your life, you've got to create it. Uh, don't wait for it. Then these things all come to you. It's amazing. There's just no stopping them. It's like they just catapult. They come and they come and they come. And, and there, are, there isn't enough of time of day or time of life uh, for, for everything that you want to know and feel and understand. And that's why when my students used to say they were bored, I would throw things at them. I literally would, and I'm totally nonviolent. But I would pick up my orange and throw it across the room. And the only time that I really lose it is when somebody says, what's there to do? <laughs> or when they say they can't do something. I think I've seen that response. Well, and, and, well. and you know what frightens me too, and I really have nothing against, I think uh, television is a remarkable invention. But one of the things that it does, if we're not careful, it makes us passive observers to life six valuable hours to the average person every night is spent in front of that tube watching other people enjoy life or I mean, fake it as if they are <laughs> well they're actors and and but it, but isn't that scary yes. six hours that you could be living a life you are watching other people live theirs but the problem is people haven't been taught how to live and we, we take for granted that we know how to live. But, but you see, that's why they need teachers. Yes. And, and they need models. And coaches. To, to show them uh, that, that life really is a banquet. And, and you know, you're not even partaking of it. And the wonderful thing, you know, I think the thing that awakens people more than ever, and sometimes we have to wait a long time for it, is I think the greatest teacher of all is death. Death is an enormously magnificent, dynamic teacher. It's democratic. It comes to everyone. And when you make your peace, truly, not just talking it, when you make your peace with the fact that you are mortal and that you are not going to live forever, all at once things really become passionate. More compelling, that's for sure. You know, it, it's so interesting. How I cannot tell you how many people that have uh, found out that they have terminal illnesses that all at once become great lovers of life. How many men have dropped over with momentary cardiac arrest and have awakened and said, what am I doing? What is the direction I'm taking? This is crazy. I'm not seeing anything. I'm not loving it, anyone. I'm not, you know, so love is, a, I mean, love too, but death is a great teacher. And uh, it says to us, if we're wise, don't wait. It can come at any time. You don't have to be 90 years old to die. Little children die. So it can come at any time in your life. Know that death is there. Knowing that, step aside from it and live because life is the gift you're given while you're waiting for death. And you know, at the point of life, we really are already starting the processes of dying. Uh, so, you know, all of us are going to go and it doesn't matter who you are, how famous or how many books you've read or how many people you've influenced, you're going to go. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, there is a, a new television show that is, is going on, you may have heard of it, uh, where they're filming certain people for 30 minutes, during which time those people are asked to leave their 
what is your legacy to yes. humankind? And uh, then they ask you once you've been selected, and I'm going to be doing mine in a few months, and it's a very interesting thing because they call it the 11th hour, and you start your talk by saying, I have one hour to live and this is what I want you to know. Wow. And, uh, and wow. then these things will be stored away, which I think is intriguing, Yes. and they will not be shown on public television until you die. Wow. And, uh, and uh, they always ask the person that they've selected for the next year's presentation to recommend three people that they think might be exciting people to share that with. Last year I recommended three and two died. Wow. So, you know, that's... You're says, not going to recommend me, are you? No. <laughs> but that says something about the fact that we don't have forever. And yes. if you're going to utilize what there is... Yes. Uh, you're going to utilize it now. You're going to you're going to not wait to love. You're going to love now. You're not going to wait to understand. You're going to try to understand now. You're not going to wait to be an educated person. You're going to get educated now. You're not going to wait to to embrace people until they were on their deathbed, which is what we wait for. Yes. Rather, you're going to do it now. So, love is a great teacher. I mean, I would say that. <laughs> Love is a great teacher, but so is death. But it sounds like pain still is a stronger motivator to give people a sense of urgency. It's like so much in life people do of what's urgent instead of what's important. Uh, you know, Tony, I'm, I'm sure that that's right, except that uh, joy would be the greatest Oh, I agree with you a thousand percent. Uh, you see, if, but we but don't, people teach, don't experience it enough. We don't teach joy. It's we like don't appreciate joy. And if you are joyous, you are really considered to be frivolous That's in true. our culture. That's I mean, true. you walk into a restaurant and there are a group of people that are just laughing and having the time of their life and you look at them and you think they're either drunk or they're idiots or, you know, or they're suspicious. You're suspicious of them because they're having a good time. Or they're not intelligent. Yeah, this is, you know, life, according to so many people, is a very serious business. Yes. What a joke. Number one, it is not a business, <laughs> and, and number and number two, it's it's hysterical because it's not serious. And unless you have a sense of humor in this crazy world, you'll surely go mad. And most people, I think, when I, when I talk to people and have people in seminars, oftentimes we have exercises where we ask people to go into the say an emotional state of intensity. Mm -hmm. Nine chances out of ten. Even though I told them you can go in a positive or a negative state, they'll pick the negative. Oh, of course. Because most people associate intensity with the negative much more than do the positive. They have easier access to pain than they do for pleasure. It's not that it's more powerful, it's just that we were more wired for that as a culture. But the question I have is, so how do we change that? How do we get more people to be able to have the experience of joy? What well, kind of, what can the people know, do? One thing that I can do is I can be joyous. Yes. And I can really be a model of joy. And I can spread within my limited realm of, of situations, I can bring joy and show people that joy is a valid emotion and happiness and laughter and giggling. I'm working on a new book and this morning I was working on a little section about the value of being silly. Oh, that's great. Uh, you know, we don't know how to be silly anymore. We don't know how to have unstructured fun. And when I say to people, have fun, they don't know what I mean. <laughs> they get a blank and stare. And they think, oh, well, we could go play golf. But, you know, that's fun, but it's, it's structured fun. Uh, uh, go play tennis and, you know, get in there and really knock that ball down their throat. Now, there's some <laughs> therapy in that, too, and that could be fun for some people. But I'm talking about non-structured fun. Yes. Um, I, I, uh, I, I was recently at a, at a dinner party where uh, the, the conversation got very heavy I mean really heavy people were talking about you know death and dying and morbidity and d disease and and uh, all of these things and and uh, one man got up and said let's skip around the room <laughs> <laughs> and you know everyone was really shocked until by his saying that he called our attention to the fact that well those things are so but there is still unstructured joy to be yeah. experienced. Let's never forget it. Let's skip around the room. Let's be silly. Let's do something nutty. Uh, I, I always remember that, um, I think it was Thomas Merton said that, that um, 
All great lovers and saints have been transcendental clowns. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's I love great. that. I mean, that's exactly what it is. What about realism? You know, so often people are focused on being realistic and it appears to well, me... Well, Tony, if we knew what was real, <laughs> then we could, could be realistic. Be. I have never been able to find out what was real. I mean, what is real? And usually most people's idea of what's real is a great deal more limited than the reality well, itself, and it's if, usually, we knew, if we knew what it it's was. It's usually negative, too. Yeah, I mean, our definition of what is reality, I don't know what reality is. I'm like that monk that says, am I a monk observing the butterfly, observing the monk, or am I the butterfly observing the butterfly, observing the monk? Or and am I, I confused? And I really don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know which I am. I don't know if I'm... You know, uh, what is this? And people have told us that, you know, life is a, is a dream and that uh, we may conceivably wake up and everything we've experienced has been within the realm of fantasy. And that's all right with me. I don't care. I don't you need... You had a good time while you were here. <laughs> I do not need to know, in quotation marks. I do not need to be certain. I can live wow, that's on really, faith. That's real magical what you just said. You can live on faith. I can live on faith and I can live on hope. And I, you know, I can live on magic. And I, I've never, ever, ever stopped believing in miracles and therefore they happen to me all the time. And the people that, that don't believe in miracles are the ones who say there are no such things as miracles. I talked to Dr. Bernie Siegel yes, a couple I, weeks back and... He said, you know, if you don't believe in miracles, then you're not being realistic. That's true. <laughs> I, it's I the absolute that. truth. I love that. And that's not incongruous at all. No, you know? I agree with you. It's that wonderful joy that language can bring an expression like that. Yes. It's what the poet is able to do with just a few words, you know. The magic of putting the words in the right places so as to create. I, I always, I mentioned to you earlier, the beauty of a koan, and there is one that I've always loved and stays with me constantly and is a great help to me, uh, the little monk that said, my barn having burned down, I can now see the moon. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, that's fantastic. That's great. But you see, that's what the poet can do in the manipulation of language and symbols and metaphor to enrich our lives and to help us to see the moon. The moon is there. We don't know it because we never bother to look at it. You know, all these wonderful things, our children's faces, they're there, but we don't look at them. We don't even look at the face of the person that we love. And that's one of the great tragedies. I remember one of the things in love class I used to ask my students was, what, what is the color of your mother's eyes? You know that only 30% of any class that I had was able to tell me what color their mother's eyes were. But they went home and looked. <laughs> so at least, at least they didn't die without knowing, you know, when they got up to heaven and God said, what is the color? Because that's certainly one of the quiz questions. Before you get in. in. That's right. I agree. And, and, uh, but imagine living with your mother all of those years and never ever looking her in the eye and saying she has brown eyes or green eyes. And, and, you know, when we, we really think about it, we know so little about the people that we love the most intensely. Do you know about, for instance, your mother's first date? Do you know about the first man that kissed her? Do you know about her greatest moment of despair? Most of the time we don't have time nor interest to know about it. And these people die, and then we wonder why we have nothing to hold on to. No sense of heritage or connection or roots. Interesting. Uh, speaking of that, you know, your father's question that he asked you uh, each night that you had to answer was what? What did you learn today, Felice? And we always had something we learned because we made a point to learn it. That's We used the encyclopedia continually. <laughs> All of us had to have something that was it. But that was such a nice exercise, and I still use it. You know, I think what he said about going to bed is ignorant as you awakened in the morning is such a terrible, terrible thing and such an awful statement about us and about our culture. But he uh, established a habit in you there that was quite useful, it sounds he like. He did, and he, he awakened in me um, a great passion for learning yes. because he had it. Yes. You see, I think sometimes people like my father who had the potential 
uh, to be really, I think, a great thinker. He already was a great lover, but he was a great thinker. But he, his circumstances in his life meant that he had to quit school when he was in the fifth grade. He then had an enormous family that he never let go hungry. He always had a sense of responsibility for everybody. And uh, gave and gave and gave and gave. And his life was fulfilled. He had no regrets, and I know that because uh, we were a year together very close when he knew he was dying. So we were able to talk about all these things. To think of what might have been, is kind of, it hurts. But it also reminds me that those of us who are still living can still achieve all of these things. And what a pity not to be able to. Uh, circumstances sometimes prevent us from doing it. But when there are no circumstances, there can be no excuses. Hmm. Interesting. He, um, he not only asked you the question each night, but he wanted to know the answer. Oh, of course. Yeah, he, uh, he, he, and if we had he any was questions. fascinated by it. And if we him. had any questions, we had to look it up, and we had to talk about it, like it wasn't enough to know the population of Nepal. You had to know where it was. Yes. So that by the time I went around the world, I knew where Nepal was. And I knew a lot about Nepal, because we used to use a lot of those things as things I just learned, you know. Yes. And uh, it's a wonderful way to lead a life. I mean, you're never ever bored, and as long as you keep adding new things to your psyche, to your mind, uh, you're a new person, and you're never boring. Yeah, that's pretty clear. You've demonstrated that pretty well, Leo. I'm impressed. <laughs> tell me, um, tell me about the time when you went back with your family back to the old country. You grew up, I uh, would be fair Los to say, Angeles. in a ghetto of Los Angeles, in that kind of At environment? At that time, it was not really, it was a ghetto, but in the positive sense of a ghetto, not the negativity that we put on a ghetto. Yeah. At that time, uh, immigrants that came to this country, out of a sense of identification and comfort, moved into neighborhoods together. So there yeah. were Italians living together, and Jewish people living together, and, and so on, German people. And this place that I lived in, East Los Angeles, which is now a, a negative type of ghetto, really, because yes. it's a center for a lot of poverty, which is a terrible thing. But uh, when I was there, it was a poor neighborhood, mm -hmm. but uh, it was a multicultural neighborhood, and it was very enriching. I mean, uh, my best friends were, I lived next door to a rabbi, and uh, I was his son's best man. Wow. Uh, I, I had Japanese friends that I cried over when they were all shipped to our U.S.-made concentration camps mm. and uh, parted with and wrote to all the time during the Second World War. And I had all the enrichment of that kind of a neighborhood to grow up in. So it wasn't really a ghetto. It was a, it was a beautiful place to be. Now at that time, um, it seems like, if I remember correctly, you were you felt a lot of hurt feelings about uh, being stigmatized with labels and so forth. Yeah, there were there were people that that used to call me a, a wop and a dago and everything else, and I had to work myself through this. It wasn't easy. I also had the stigma of being very poor, and uh, other people had roller skates. I never had a pair of roller skates my whole life. I never had a bicycle. Uh, as I said, the only book I ever owned that was really mine was one that a librarian gave me. The first record of an opera that I ever got was given to me by another dear friend. And, uh, but none of that really hurt me. Um, it helped me to appreciate and to value and to know that I had a responsibility to people that didn't have. And uh, that's why I've spent this latter part of my life giving everything away. I have no need for anything. I set up a foundation called the Felice Foundation, which means happiness in Italian. Wow. And what we do is, is we give money to people who are involved in projects in which there is a, an educational component of teaching other people the joy of giving. Wow. And uh, that makes me so happy because I know that once you get people to giving, they recognize that there is no greater joy. Yes. I mean, there's nothing we can do in our lives that gives us the satisfaction and the fulfillment of giving. And now I'm not talking just about money, mm -hmm. which is the first thing people think about. 
writing that check to the charity is fine, but it isn't the same yeah. as going there and holding an AIDS patient in your arms. And it isn't the same as going to a home for the elderly and sitting there and holding the hand of this lonely woman that nobody has come to see for days. And it isn't the same as picking up the vomit off the floor of someone who's ill and cleaning it up. Those are the things that give us that satisfaction. I've done something for the world today. I've left it better. And after a while that becomes so overwhelming and so beautiful that you don't even think about it. You just do it because it's an innate, natural impulse to give and to share. And most people don't realize they have that opportunity. That's right. You know, I used to make it mandatory, among other things, that everyone in my classes give something to someone, do something for somebody else. I used to get kids that come to me and ask me, what's there to do? What's there to do? I mean, are you out of your mind? Where do you live on the planet Venus? I mean, just look around you. There are hungry people. There are lonely people. There are, are children that need. There are people that can't read. There are, are houses that need cleaning. You know, uh, uh, Mother Teresa says that the greatest symbol of, of, of love is to pick up a broom and sweep off somebody's doorstep. I, I, you know, you don't need a million dollars. It's wonderful to have a million dollars and to be able to give it away. I mean, that's really, I think, as far as I'm concerned, that's the main purpose of having a million dollars. But, but you don't need it in order to give. And do you feel that by giving the million dollars, you sometimes don't get as much satisfaction as by sweeping somebody's doorstep or cleaning up somebody's vomit? Yes. I have a, uh, and transferring that for years, on Thanksgiving I grew up fairly poor myself, and um, somebody came and delivered food to our home. Mm -hmm. And um, we didn't want to take it, my dad didn't want to take it, but we had to. And I promised from then on that I would feed people, but I'd never written a check. I went out one day just spontaneously when I was 18 and went shopping. And it was so much fun to go shopping for them and then go deliver it as the worker delivering it, not the person giving it. And uh, we've done that every year since I was 18 years old. And now I've taken my children and uh, seeing my four-year-old boy go out in a park where we create big baskets because we put, you know, blankets in it and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, food and everything else. And we go out there and, and the guy lying on the ground of an open bathroom in a park with all these clothes he's taken from different places to try and keep himself warm. And my son, I said, go in and take it into him and wish him a happy Thanksgiving. And, him going in, the man lying on the floor, and all of a sudden as he puts it in and says, Happy Thanksgiving, the man grabbed my son's arm, and I jumped inside, mm -hmm. as you can imagine. So my son, he let out a yell, and the man just looked at him and took his hand and kissed it, mm -hmm. and set him back down and said, Thank you. And, you know, that kind of an experience, you know, for a four year old, one he'll never get, I know I'll never forget it. And you know, people need to have experiences like that, because once you've had one, you get addicted. And that addiction is a life addiction that creates the kind of passion and joy that comes through in every word you speak. And if we must have addictions, and I think we probably must, positive addictions are wonderful. Yes. I mean, addictions of, of saying hello to people and smiling yes. at them and, and sharing what you have and recognizing your responsibility to someone else. Those are nice addictions. They're yes. healthy and they help everyone to grow. So it's, it's a beautiful thing and we need to teach those. You yes. do need to, you yes. know, we do have it innate in ourselves, but as you grow up, you become a little frightened about extending yourself. Will I be rejected? Will it be? But well, you'll never know until you try it. Yeah. And it's true with all the valuable experiences, unless you try them. If you wait to find out that you're safe, you'll find out you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> And safe, safety is not high on the list for you, that's clear. Let me ask you, how do we teach people to love? We've said people have to learn to love, how? And I don't think we, I, maybe there are some of us who can, I don't know, but I know I cannot teach people how to love. I can offer them all kinds of things, I have all kinds of ideas for them to think about. Um, meditations to become involved in, uh, uh, things to do, but just suggestions. Uh, if, if you review all the books I've written, uh, never once has any one of these books been classified as a how-to. Mm -hmm. You know, the New York Times book reviews has the bestseller list. Well, mine, fortunately, have been number one, several of mine. In fact, yes. I had four 
on the bestseller list at the same time at one time. And, and uh, they classify books as nonfiction fiction and uh, how-tos. And never once have they classified any book of mine as a how-to. And that's because I've never told people, this is how you do it. I've offered a thousand alternatives. Metaphors and examples. Uh, uh, examples and of, of loving behavior, of, of, of examples of pain and overcoming fear and things like that. And I just say, look at this. Uh, it's, it's really basically the way you teach. You're a very foolish person if you think you teach people by telling them things. Nine and nine or 18. My concept of teaching has always been to set up a gourmet table and inviting people to eat, recognizing that if you have a diversity of foods, everybody will find something that he or she likes. Mm -hmm. But if you have only a few little dishes, you're going to find people that are allergic to those dishes, that dislike them with a passion, and that will never come back to your table again. So that when you bring these people to the table, you say, Help yourself to whatever you want. Mm. Try it out. And if it's good and it works, why don't you try the asparagus next time? <laughs> or the artichokes? Because you may find that these are good. And if you don't, discard them and don't have any more artichokes. But this is the way that we introduce people. In other words, uh, uh, Exupéry, the great French philosopher, said that, that learning is a leading out not a forcing in. Yes. Uh, yes. So, so it's wonderful to think that all that we need to be the perfect us is already in us. I agree. And what the teacher does is help us to get in touch with those things and encourages us to bring them out. And when we do, reinforces them and celebrates them and says, now go in again and find something else. Yes. Socrates said learning is remembering. So I think that all the resources are there. Again, it's getting people to be aware of it. And mm -hmm. as you said, metaphor and story and example seem to be the most powerful. You've certainly done an incredible job of that. A lot of the stories you pull from, it appears, there's a, quite a bit of Zen stories or Buddhism. Has that played a role in your when evolution? I, when I was in Asia, I went to, it was a very popular thing at the time, but I think I'd do it again. Uh, I was uh, in Japan and I studied with a Zen master. And then uh, when I was in Bangkok, in Thailand, I went out to a monastery and lived with the monks, the Buddhist monks, uh, Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, and I lived with them and did what they did. I went out and begged and um, we chanted and we meditated. And we, we learned from a great, great teacher who is still living and whom I visit often. And, and it was wonderful. But now all of the things that I learned just as this Buddhist teachers said, anything that I learned there, I could have learned here. Yes. If I had learned to open my eyes here. So I am not suggesting that everybody pack up and run off to a Buddhist monastery. <laughs> I mean, for many people, the Beatles proved this, for many people it was a waste of time. Yes. Uh, they went there all gung-ho about finding enlightenment and found out that they had the enlightenment they needed in London. They didn't need to go there. So there are many ways there are many paths, there are many people, there are many teachers, and it's wonderful because that means we can choose, we can select, and we can find those teachers, those learnings that are congruous with us and, and take them on. What about um, people who've had the same experience, the same reference in life? Maybe somebody, two people have been abused and yet they turn out so differently. Why? Well, you know, I think a lot of life is an attitude and a choice. One person can get slapped and turn inward forever and never extend themselves again. And another one can get slapped 50 times and walk off saying, it's okay. I mean, I, have my, I don't feel it as much. The hide is harder now. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, I, I just think it's, it's, everyone kind of thinks that uh, maybe my life is all joy and all magic and all wonder. I don't live in a separate world. I live in the same world that everybody lives in. I have to deal with the same traffic, with the same income taxes, with the same bigoted people, with the same... Whatever destroys with someone else, it destroys also with me. 
The difference is the way in which I approach these things. And uh, you see, I don't see that there are any really bad experiences. It's a fairly important belief. Uh, I, I think every experience has a value, and that the sad part of an experience is when you don't learn from it. And then if you don't learn from it, you go right back into it again, and you're very likely to get another slap. So uh, you learn, you suffer, uh, you, you become more, you go back into a situation again, you learn again, you, and so on. And it becomes a continual process where even then the most seemingly painful things to other people become very positive to you because you, you turn them into learning experiences. And I think that's, that's the, maybe the secret, if there is a secret to happiness, is to find a way of turning all experiences into positive experiences. And you can. I mean, if you could look at the most final and devastating of experiences, like death, as a positive experience, suggesting that you live life, then anything else is in significance, it pales against it. What, what do you do, uh, again, I know you're not going to tell somebody what the meaning is, but it comes down to the meaning people pull from things. What would you say to somebody, for example, who lost their son at 15 years old, he was just killed in a car accident like that, and they have so much pain, and they are staying in that painful state? I, I don't know if you knew it, but I did a, a book called The Fall of Freddy the Leaf, which no. is about death, and uh, with it are two tapes about grieving. And um, one of the things that I stress there is that everybody has a right to feel what they feel. Yes. And when, I mean, if you didn't grieve after the death of someone you loved, you would be inhuman. Yes. So scream and yell and cry and beat the walls and, 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 and bemoan your fate and, and cry over the, uh, over the grave and let it all hang out. And then recognize that this is all in the process of living and that you have no control over this that control is some greater power about which you know almost nothing let it be let it go uh, and then I think you can take anything but to deny yourself because you think it's effeminate or you think it's it's uh, it, it shows your lack of control to deny yourself your feelings is to deny a very essential part of you. Uh, and there are some people who swallow so hard over the loss of something that that sticks in their throat forever and they're never the same. Everything they see is through dark, dim curtains for the rest of their lives. And that means you've not only lost one life, you've lost two. Or more if you have a family or Your people you touched. Your own. Yes. Right. <laughs> Leo, what really deters love? What fear, keeps it from happening? Fear, I think, more than anything else. Cowardice. Because you see, it takes great strength to love. To be vulnerable? You, you're, you're vulnerable, and you, uh, you may be hurt. Um, things may not go as you hoped they would. Your expectations may not be fulfilled. All those things make you fearful. There's really nothing to fear. Uh, again, uh, if you love because you are a lover, then no one can hurt you. In its other words, it's like giving away a bag of oranges to people. Not because you expect that people are going to say, oh, thank you, I'm dying for an orange. <laughs> but rather, you give it away because it brings joy to you. Yes. So you have nothing to lose in loving. Now, it's when you have ulterior motives yes. and strings attached to your love. But don't you see, Tony, that's no longer love. Yes. Love with strings is just like, you know, a puppet. It doesn't work. You, you, when you give love, you, you love to love. And you don't give love to be loved. Yes. So that there's nothing really to fear and there's no chance of your being hurt. And that's tough to do because, you know, we always, we're brought up in a culture that says, don't you give that jerk anything unless that jerk gives it back. You know, and the, the measure as to whether you're going to, how much you're going to give is determined by how much you get. You know, it always amuses me at Christmas time that people keep Christmas lists and they send a Christmas card and because the Browns didn't send you one, oh, 
the list, Jim. Go. I mean, how dare... Why, do you send Christmas cards to get them back? I mean, this is so cuckoo. And, and do you give a gift uh, because you feel you must? Well, if you do, as far as I'm concerned, keep it. I don't want your gift. It's only a gift by definition if it's given freely in joy with no strings attached. And that's true of love. Yes. And so when we go out saying we're in search of love, well, you're in search of what you want from somebody else's love. It's not that you're going out to give it because, you know, you can give it and give it and give it and give it and you never run out. So if some people I know, one I know intimately, <laughs> myself, I know that one of my patterns in the past was I always had to give more than anybody else to feel like I was being a giver, to feel like I was deserving love, whatever the case may be. And I still see that pattern sometimes in myself if I'm honest with myself. Where, where do you see that pattern coming from, from the standpoint of is that pattern from your perception something that is fine as long as you realize it and you're experiencing the joy of giving and you're not doing because you have to or well yes I think you've answered it I, I really think that if you're giving it doesn't matter how much you give you see you don't weigh it yes uh, it, it isn't a commodity that you yes. can weigh like you give me two pounds of love and then I'll give you three pounds yes. and then I'll be superior because I gave you three pounds and right. then you have a pound you owe me uh, that, that's the wonderful thing about love if it isn't given without strings yes. it literally isn't love yes and and so when when we're loving we have really again back to your original question nothing to fear yes. if we're really loving but you see poor love it's so debased <laughs> I mean yeah, we blame everything on love you know it's like it's love's fault it's love doesn't do this and love is usually a lack of love it, doesn't well do those you know things. the thing is 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 it's not love that does it it's you yes. who does it it's we who do it I, I mean love isn't responsible for those things love in in its classic sense is so wonderful and so pure and and so dedicated to growth and so concerned with the magic and wonder of life it has nothing to do with all this negativity we bring the negativity you see I, I'm constantly reminding people, love is very simple. It's we who are complex. So what is love? I know you didn't, I, defi I you didn't define, define it. Define I know it. you never define it. I, I know I, you don't. I can say this about love. You can break it down into all kinds of qualities. Okay. Well, so anybody... are the qualities of a great lover. Okay, that's easy. You know, I wrote the, the book uh, Loving Each Other. Yes. And what I did is I sent out questionnaires to uh, over a thousand people that had managed to maintain a permanent relationship for like 15, 20 years. And I said to them, what are the qualities of love that enriched your love, that yes. made it lasting? And the, the qualities were very simple. The first one, and you probably could guess this right off the top of your head, was communication. Yes. The ability for us to talk to each other and not to be afraid to express what we feel. You know, now people know this and know this and know this, but do they work on communication? Never! In fact, sad to say is that we've almost forgotten the fine art of conversation wherein all these things are revealed. I don't say to go home and say to your wife uh, this evening, now sit down honey, I'm going to tell you about all these negative things or all these positive <laughs> things. That isn't conversation. Uh, um, conversation is the stuff that comes out naturally by being together and being intimate. That's when you can begin to talk about the things that really are important and that really matter. And, and you know, one of the things that uh, uh, forgiveness was way up on the list, yes. which is absolutely essential. And, and then affection. And isn't it interesting that they separated affection from sexuality? And affection was like something like two or three, and sexuality was like eight. Now, if you looked at the literature, you'd think that unless you have the perfect sex life, <laughs> and unless you know the G-spot, you are doomed. I mean, you are... 22 hour orgasm. That's <laughs> right, and all these the, 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 let's practice position 48. I mean, this has nothing to do in these people's minds with affection. Yes. Affection is reaching out tenderly at a moment and touching someone. Yeah. Uh, affection has to do with writing a little note and putting it in the refrigerator and saying, honey, I don't know what I'd do without you. Affection is when 
she comes home and she's dented the car and you say it's okay it's only a car are you all right yeah. though that's affection and see um, uh, we, we we've taken sexuality which was a very wonderful part of affection and we've we've segregated it in people's yeah. minds and now we talk about making out we don't talk about making love and and you know that's devastating when you think about it and there again is the depreciation of love yes we we don't say you know i love you we're afraid to say i love you and people don't hear it enough and when they hear it they become suspicious frightened uh, they don't know how to handle it uh, so it's it's just a, it's coming to a screeching halt tony and it's to say to ourselves what's really really important and if those are the things that are really important am i on the path to achieving them and if the answer is no then stopping whatever you're doing until your answer can be yes other than that there is no way that you'll ever find love no way that you'll ever find happiness or no way that you'll ever find fulfillment in this life